I'd like to ask you a question to reflect on while Rabbi Yal will play for us one or more than one nigunim that we had learned before. The question I want you to consider is the following. Hanukkah is about to come and most of the time when we sing Hanukkah songs we sing for the children, like Hanukkah, Hanukkah, Ayante, Vashem, you know, this kind of stuff. What is it that Hanukkah means for grown-ups? And let me say it, make it a little bit larger, because the strange thing is that if you were to say to a Christian, what does Hanukkah mean to you? He you might say, I have Christmas, and I want to say, Roses are reddish, violets are bluish. If it weren't for Hanukkah, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> you wouldn't be Christians. Because there is something about the way in which history goes. And so it feeds in to that celebration of the birth of the Redeemer. Now figure, how does this all work out? So whatever comes to you about Hanukkah, at any level of depth, do that. Now I'm going to light one candle, though. So... Your microphone. Yeah. The rule about Hanukkah candles is that you cannot do anything useful by their light. Mm -hmm. That's to say, uh, most of the time when people had a candle in, in a home, what was a candle? It was one of those oil lamps, you know, with a little spout, and that's what they had. So one of them was on on a regular night. Two of these were on for Shabbos, and it was pretty dark. You, you get the idea? So there was so much to light as utility that, what would you think? You make a light, now you can use a light. Along comes the Hanukkah candle thing, and it says, this is one only to look at. Okay. So I want you to look at the candle that's going to be burning, and uh, we'll hum the melody, not say the words, but hum the melody of the brochus. And then you'll consider this question that I raised with you in silence or with some music that Rabbi Yal is going to give us. Ready?
consideration. See if you can say something in a couple of sentences. Please. Um, it felt like a, a flame pointing me to heaven. Uh-huh. Right. To God, from, to God. A flame rising from my heart as it were to heaven. That is the deepest part of this metaphor of candle here, to be able to say, and remember the Hanukkah candle we are not supposed to have any utility from, so it is only for seeing. If it's only for seeing, that's to say to, to take the gaze and hold the gaze on this thing. Now, if it's not for any use, what is it? And what you see is there's fuel and there is a wick that makes that fuel become gas and then the flame lights it and it burns. And so, you then ask, what for? If it's not for a use, why bother using up the oxygen and the fuel and all that kind of stuff? And what you get is that for a time when we don't have a holy temple anymore, uh, to offer sacrifices. You know, most of us today don't have a, a sense of what does it mean to want to bring to God a sacrifice. The word that always means, oh yeah, I have to make a sacrifice, I have to deprive myself, you know, uh, uh, of something. Rather than sacrificere, to make something holy, to lift it up and make it holy. So, what is it if you take something that you cherish and treasure, and that has no blemish, you know, and that's the sacrifice that the Bible prescribes here to, to bring. And you have a sense that you invest a lot of energy in that being. So when they describe how the Paschal Lamb had to be sacrificed on Passover, they describe that for a few days you have to take that lamb into your home and feed it and get to know it. Which is the very opposite of how we look at meat today, you know? We look at meat as a commodity and that's the the very opposite of that. And that, giving that away and saying that to God, this is what I want to give to you. So there is a feeling that Rav Shlomo set a tune to. Give me that same minor. Mm, a little higher. Mm, unto thee I shall offer an oblation of thanksgiving unto thee. I shall offer an oblation of thanks in the house of the Lord, in thy state. So Jerusalem in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem's place. La la la. La 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 
la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la la So that's wonderful. You already have done a sacrifice this time in song, you know? When you express, I'm so grateful, uh, what can I give you? I want to offer something to you, what can I give you? So, it was an investment that a person had, and Freud would speak of such an investment, an energy investment, he calls it investing libido, connecting libido, to put that energy into, into that being. So when I like somebody very much, I've con uh, you know, connected a lot of lib libido in, in that person. And therefore, when the parting comes, it's like such a pain to feel that that love that was flowing between me and that other person is now suddenly gone and I feel bereft and, and, and cut off in a way. So you get the sense of, and I am willing to give this up to you because I feel so grateful to you. I can, I, you know, it's like saying, uh, what can I give you that's precious to me? Okay. And so we have to invest a sacrifice already with some preciousness of ourselves. And so in this song it comes so, so, so nicely, first it asks the question, what can I give you? And then it says, it visualizes, I'm doing it right now in the house of the Lord, in Jerusalem's gate, you know, here, here I'm doing it. And the music takes you, and that's what a nigan basically has to be. Now I want to take a little time out to talk about, it's going to take a few times, so love my back, if you want. <laughs> and. Um, Talk a little bit about Hanukkah for grown-ups, what that, what that stuff is about, okay? Imagine we were now to design a temple. Okay, this is good stuff, let me save that. <laughs> How would I want to go about building a temple? Mm -hmm. So I'm calling in uh, some architects and I say I want to build a temple. Do you know what a temple is? They know what a mall is, what a bank is, what, <laughs> what a high rise is. But do you know what a temple is? And I want to say that so many religious buildings were built by architects who had no notion what a temple is. When I go back to those old people who built the uh, cathedrals, now they knew what it meant to build a temple, you know, because they call themselves Templars for that reason too, uh, because that was, their, that was their stuff. So the question is, what should it do for us, that temple? And on one level, I would want a temple to be sending out, you know, like this atomic clock that's over here, and it sends out those people who own such watches and clocks, it sets them right it, all the time, and it gives a good signal. So if there were a signal that would be going through the universe with the message, I am the Lord your God. Okay. So nothing more but that. And that message keeps going, and after a while you live in that message, it's sort of a repeating loop, you know? Uh, and after a while you don't pay attention to it anymore, but it still is running inside of you at this point. And then comes the question of, um, how do we wake up to that, you know? But that's the next level. So. We would want the temple to beam out such a thing. Okay. When do we want to come and be there? Well, I have a feeling that if a year goes by and God hasn't looked at me, I get lost. You know, If I could make it happen three times a year, that would be so wonderful. 
So the Torah has it there, Shalosh Pamin Bashana Yerae Kozakucha at Pinea Shemilokecha. Three times a year, let everyone come up to the temple to be seen by God. Okay. Now, if you, if you can imagine what this, how wonderful this would be. I may not see God, but all of a sudden I get flooded that God saw me and said, it's okay, Zalvin. <laughs> you know? uh, that kind of a thing would be a very strong thing to have. So I would like the temple to provide that kind of a beam to me so that I could be in touch with that. When do I want to get there? Well, every time there's an important life cycle moment, you know, I'd want to go up there and, and be in this place and sort of check in so that God should see me now this time, you know. It's almost like saying, I married off my last daughter, Rebbeinu Shalala, I've come to thank you for my life up to here, and so on and so forth. It feels, feels good to be able to, to experience life cycles with God in that place. So you hear, mm -hmm. temple, life cycles with God in that place. What else? I'd want to create a vibe around that place that would say this is not ordinary. To put it in other words, it's, this is not secular. I don't want to have to define for anybody right now what is holy, but there is an element that has something with a certain kind of dread connected to it. You know, it's not uh, something we want to touch with our cotton-picking fing fingers. Approaching this, you have a feeling that you have to drop something. You can't go into this place with a certain kind of baggage. So when Moses comes to meet God at the burning bush, take off your shoes. Take off your shoes. Now the Hebrew, on the level in which Hasidim understand that, shoes, the word for shoe is the same word as for lock, something that locks you in. And where are we locked in? In raglecha, and the Hebrew word for leg, regel, also is connected with habit. So it, and the word shal means slough off. Mm. So it says you enter into the holy place, the response of that is to slough off any habituated responses. Mm. And to be so totally in the right now, in this place, so that I don't embarrass God to have to speak to me what I want God to speak to me about. But that I can be in this other place to receive what that beneficent source of life to which I always feel grateful for the privilege to be alive and conscious and which sustains us and gives us all this. So I want to honor that and so I want to bring my life cycle situations into that place that should also have that beacon, should also remind me of holy. And that means that once I come to that place, ah, there's a fancy word for it. Um, in uh, tape recording, there's a thing that if you want to record over another tape, that has been recorded on that you can. But there has to be something to degauss it, you know, which is to take out all the imprints that are, that are there and set it back to its original standards. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, take the cookies out, you know, and, and, the, and the spies and all that kind of geschäft, so now that, the, that you have it really clean. And at least thrice a year, three times a year, I want to be able to come to that place 
where I could be so irradiated that the dross would fall off from me mm. and, what, and I would be realigned to the divine purpose. That. So you get a sense of, of, just as I'm describing to you, what we want the temple to, to be. Now, it would have to have a certain amount of beauty. Um, the beauty has to be that kind of beauty that makes me not think of a thing out, on the outside, but makes me look with the inner vision like that. So if you can imagine a Rosetta window in one of the big cathedrals at sunrise, <laughs> okay? So you could see that, how would I say, it, it's meant to turn you on, right? You get to a place where you see a certain kind of beauty, a certain kind of harmony, and, uh, and that, that's another ingredient for temple. Okay. Now all around the temple that I would design, yeah, I would want to have uh, jets from all around the temple that should blow to us as something that would make us all love each other. <laughs> okay? Right? So we come in to the presence of God with this thanksgiving, with this wonderful feeling to get realigned, to get irradiated and, and so on and so forth. And all this kind of wonderful thing is happening. While when we look around, everyone we see, we can say, gee, I love you. <laughs> you know? And I'm glad you share the universe with me and that we are children of God together. It's just, it's, it's just so wonderful. That would also have to be an ingredient in the temple. Because when I start thinking about some places of worship, how much battle there is going on, and if it is not overt, then it's covert for place, for ego, for uh, recognition, for power, you know. And so many houses of worship have their problems with this kind of thing. And this would have to have it not happen that way. <laughs> now, this is something that's going on for a while and the people have been entrained in it, so much so that they count their time for around the visits to the sanctuary. You know, it's like, how do you mark time? How do you, where is your, your, your time marker? And that has now become holy too, do you see? Because when I can uh, mark time according to the seasons, and call Elim Oade Adonai Mikrai Kodesh. These are the, the seasons, the meeting times with God, <laughs> you know, the, the, holy, the, the holy moments. And so that's, that's set aside in, in, to have to happen in time. Then there are generations. Could you imagine what would have been that you are about, well, if I follow what the rabbis say, you aren't even three years old, you're already toilet trained. That's the only thing that, that, that has happened. And you're sitting on the shoulders of your father who takes you up to the base of Mikdash. And your eyes are so gee whiz <laughs> at that time, you know? It's like what you see, it, it's, it's so exciting. And I'm here with Papa and all the people and this is a special place, you know, I mean, the kids, kids feel that there, there's something, how would I say, it tickles in the belly in a particular way if you're a kid about things that are exciting. And so you have that happen to you. And the next year again, and the next year again, and each time you grow along with that and your understanding of that holy place and God and all that grows along with you. So it isn't static in one place. And now it happens that there is a power in the world that doesn't like that. 
Now, could you imagine for a moment uh, that in the same place where I would want to build a temple, Walmart would want to come? Okay? And you would get to, to have such a sense of um, what's wrong with that kind of marketplace um, mentality that this is about to bring here. Mustn't be that way. But if you were to look at the possible customers that you could have here, who always come on pilgrimage times and so on and so forth, where else would you want to build your place? Okay. So, if you could imagine that against this temple, we now have a situation where corporations are trying to make their way to take that away from us. Okay. Because it does not fit the worldview that they are trying to promote. The worldview in that time was Hellenistic. And it was mercantile, if you will. And uh, yes, there were some people there who were closer to Greek philosophy and, and, and myth, but most of the people were in the agora, you know, sort of a place in the marketplace and so on and so forth. And they have a, a king, and this king is bent on getting rid of that place that beams out this kind of stuff. Okay? It is so totally against him. So now, there's a battle and he gets in there, and the first thing that he has to do now is to disconnect the signal or to reset the signal in such a way that it should not steer to it, but should steer away from it. Now, if you can understand how this, how this thing comes out from a contemporary perspective, you get to understand what kind of a um, real inner tragedy it was for the people who had a temple which suddenly got uh, desecrated, and instead of bringing them that signal that they need, how confused they must have been, and so on and so forth. And then you get the story of the Maccabees, who decide this can't go on. And on, on that basis, they go ahead and there's this battle going on, and it's a, a cultural battle. It wasn't like uh, that the um, people under Antiochus were into killing Jews like Nazis. They were into converting, if you will, Jews away from the way of God and Torah and holiness to that mercantile way that they had, so that the market should be free open. You know, as, I, as I'm talking about Hanukkah, can you see how we are in that, in that space ourselves? Yeah, right. Right? And so the temple that we would have to build so that we could get realigned of things and that the world, the planet could be healed. That's, that's the kind of work that we have to do and not necessarily with the sword because they don't come at us with a sword either. They come at us with um, the media, okay? So the question of how to arm people and so, and so on and so forth, all this comes up for us for Hanukkah. Then comes the business of the miracle of the oil. So finally they come back to the temple and the cleanup that has to happen there. there the sense of um, intentional filth dumped on somebody else's holy place is different than just a dump, you know, where, where you drop stuff off. And there was a time when the, when the wall, what was left of the holy wall, was used that way as a dump in Jerusalem until an emperor came and buried gold coins there 
and asked and, uh, and said to the people, there, there's more gold here, and every time he seeded more gold until they had cleaned away all the schmutz that was there. Mm -hmm. But you can understand how, how important it was to do that cleanup. So now it's true that in their technology, oil that had the seal of the holy, of, of, of the high priest on it, that that oil was certainly okay to use in the menorah. Okay. Now let's go and see what's the menorah. What's the menorah? The branches are seven branches. And if you look at the description of what an angel, a seraph, looks like, he has six wings. And with two is described, they cover the face, with two they fly, and with two they cover the, the legs. And when they all lift up their wings, you know, all the six wings at the same time, you have the sense of menorah, you have the sense of seraph there. So these are interchangeable symbols because an angel doesn't look like a person with big wings, <laughs> you know. Uh, and at the same time, that's a way in which we can get to a feeling place with it, okay? So, dedicating the temple turns the temple on. How would I say it? They, the description is that there was a special kind of oil that was put over the tabernacle walls, and that Shemen Hamishcha brought the Mishkan to life. That's to say, it was no longer a building, it was an entity. Okay? And furthermore, they say, when the menorah was lit, that building became conscious. Now, just get a feel of that, you know? And so cleaning it up and lighting the menorah is such an important part of that because it brings that it's like turning on again the switch to clean God uh, uh, message stuff. So they, they straightened that out by lighting the menorah at that point, which meant that the temple became not only washed clean, but alive and conscious again. Now, then they talk about this, this was a miracle that lasted for eight days over a small amount of oil. And, you know, every time these, you go into that from a more adult point of view, you get to see how contemporary the whole business is, you know. Where do we find clean oil, you know, uh, that hasn't been contaminated by all kinds of um, contamination? Right? But to get that one, and to say, and how could we make it last? So, another way of saying, how do we deal with um, those sources of energy in such a way that we don't exhaust them? And there's a miracle, and the miracle is that if you trust, it'll burn for eight days, you know? There is, there are ways that we haven't yet found out, but if we could find that energy source that still has that seal of the high priest on it, of that, of that, that kind of awareness, of holiness, what a wonderful thing that would be. So I thought I wanted to share this, this element. There are so many other connections with that. There used to be a thing that was called Hanukkah guilt. Uh, to give money uh, to people, and it was like, because everybody could get Hanukkah guilt, you could give a bigger portion to the more hungry people at that point. The same thing happened about playing dreidel. Uh, they used to have a rule that um, you'd bought your chips, as it were, and a poor person could buy a chip for a penny and a rich person for a dollar, you know? And so that's how they would play dreidel, each one would put in a chip, but by the end, even if you lost, you won a lot. You came uh, back if you were poor with more than you had before. All these, these things had to do with Hanukkah, with getting Hanukkah for people. Gifts on Hanukkah were more, much more Christmassy than, uh, than they were in the tradition. 
But hanging out together, singing the songs and so on and so forth, that was a different story. So, if you recall, this is a you know, C major. If you recall how you used to sing Mao uh, Sur Yeshua Ti the Hanukkah song, Rock of Ages, remember? And the second stanza was Children of the Martyr Race, whether chained or fettered. Well, I went back to the Hebrew and retranslated it. And if you look at the acrostic, each, I hope you have a sheet, and if not, would you please share with somebody? So if you look, M R D K I H. Do you see the acrostics? The beginning of each stanza. M R D K I. That stands for Mordechai, <laughs> which was the, the, the author of the Maus Sur. And we sing the Maus Sur always for Hanukkah. But what he meant that song to be was for all the holidays, as you will see as I, we sing the translation. Ready? My salvation stronghold for praising you with such delight. to have some words that didn't get them in trouble. <laughs> so while the rest were singing about Christmas, they were singing Mausur. And this is how it came to us, so we can sing the next stanza. Rampers, pyramids, and force, Egypt had a Dear to 
that sheet you see right afterwards, Al Hanisim. Al Hanisim is a Hanukkah prayer that's included in uh, the daily uh, three prayers, that's included in Birchat Amazon when we give thanks for food. And we have special occasions. So for Purim, we have an insert, and there's a, a, an insert for Hanukkah. But I wasn't happy with the way in which um, uh, it was written. First of all, it called all the Greeks to task. But here, I wanted to make sure it's Antiochus that we are dealing with. There were some Greeks that we were pretty close and friendly with. So, I rewrote it, and here it goes. So you might read it when uh, you're lighting the Hanukkah candles. In the days of Matityahu, high priest, and his sons, when there arose against them the reign of wicked Antiochus seeking to uproot our faith and law, oppressing us, they conquered our temple and des desecrated our sanctuary. And then there arose against them your devout priests, and you, in your great compassion, stood by them in their troubles, waging their wars, avenging their pain, helping them to overcome them and to purify the sanctuary. And this longing for your presence among them, they sought to kindle pure lamps and not finding enough pure oil. You led them to find some, though enough for only one day. In trust, they kindled the lamp and you miraculously made the oil last until they could make them afresh. Then they did set these days of Hanukkah to lighting candles, to chant the Hallel in gratitude to your great reputation for your miracles, your wonders, and your salvation, and to give stucca to the poor and toys to the children. <laughs> that wasn't in the original no, 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 one either. Yeah. I see that um, you are really into singing tonight, and I'm very happy for that. Because I have a need. The need is, Eyal has taken the songs that I remembered from the, before the days of the Holocaust to songs that I've written myself, to chants that I've used with people. And he has put them into uh, music legible wow. music with even guitar chords wow. to him. So I would like to be able to get that published in a while. Mm -hmm. Along with it, I'd like to have a um, CD-ROM. And some of these I could sing and that wouldn't be a problem. But there are some others that I need you to be choir-like. Okay? So, they are meant to be rounds. So I will ask, uh, teach you one round, and then we will set up sort of in four groups, okay? And we'll do that, those rounds. Now I want to say something about why I chose them. <laughs> one of the things that people often, they know the words, but they don't, do more than the words with them, and that's a real pity. When we talk about the four worlds, you know? What do we mean to say by the four worlds? We don't mean to say that they're the same world except in different colors, you know? We mean to say they're different universes of discourse. And when you are looking at the universe of action, it's different than the universe of feeling, which is different than the universe of reasoning, mind, stuff, intellect. And that's again different from the world of intuition. So, how do I get this across to people, this whole four worlds thing that is behind the, the way in which we think, not only in Jewish renewal, but if you look at the four yogas and look at the four ways in Sufism, there, these four always keep coming up because we are hardwired in that way we have the reptilian, the limbic, we have the cortex and we have brain mass that we haven't got any words for except that that's where our intuitions seem to come from. 
So these four ways are, are, are just, you know, all through. So how do, how, do I, how do I teach it? So one way to teach it is that there are moments in which the way in which the physical world, without our interference, the physical world, how it would do things, we'd have to say it's perfect. It's perfect this way, you know, it's perfect that children born should have mothers that have breasts that would feed them, you know. It's perfect that the sun rises and sets, it's perfect that gravity works. So that sense gives us a sense of the reality map of this world. It is perfect. In the world of feeling, nothing matters as much as that one thing. Am I loved? Does anybody love me? You know? Do I matter to someone? You know? Does anybody love me? That is such a deep, we, we don't own it or to ourselves so much, how much, how deep this sits and how it wants. So when the second part, of, first part of the chant is, it is perfect. Second part is, you are loved. When you get the sense that affirmation, you are loved, that's very helpful in that world, in that world of feeling. In the world of mind, what we would like more than anything else would be clarity. You know, not to be confused, to see a, a thing as it really is, to understand the thing as it is re really is. So, what's, where is the place where I can get to that? So I could say, it is perfect, you are loved, all is clear. Could you imagine how wonderful that would be? <laughs> the, the moment where we would say, all is clear. And then comes a word that some people haven't been able to, weren't happy with. But it's nevertheless the way in which it works is true, which is, I am holy. So it is perfect, you are loved, all is clear, and I am holy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm, a little higher would help. Mm, yeah. It is perfect. You are loved. All is clear, and I am holy. It is perfect. You.
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. With the same kind of a melody, I used to do things for weddings. And the chant went, body to body, mind to mind, soul to soul, and destiny to destiny, body to body, mind to mind, soul to soul, and destiny to destiny, body to body, mind to mind, soul to What I had in mind with that melody was, you know, when they have this picture of someone standing over the cauldron with boil and bubble, you know, uh, to sort of cook up for that couple, you know, that kind of relational glue that'll make their marriage hassle-proof. <laughs> so, that, that, that was that part with it. Now, I don't see any other one except the Echad Yachid and Yuchad, which we did do once here. Again, the man, yeah. We'll be able to take this off later on and, and use those tracks that we have just made along with that CD, so, so people will be able to hear how how these chants get handled. So. Yeah, but slower. Uh, uh, a little higher. Yeah. of us don't have any trouble to think of the, the number one. But then, most of the time, the way in which we think of the number one would be that one and one makes two. And when we speak of God as being one, we don't mean a one and one making two. It's almost like saying, in order that one and one will be one. And how do you understand that? Because you begin to see 
that oneness has several dimensions to it. And when you can recognize in oneness in so many di dimensions, that they almost are infinite dimensions in which that oneness can show itself, then you are, have logged on to the word universe. Get that? In uni, you log on to the one. In verse, you log on to all that, that, that's so numberless, yeah? And so how could you make sense by saying it is both one and it is both so many? So you have to say that that oneness is still there, but the manyness are different dimensions of that oneness. And if you get to think about that, then you would say, what kind of a one am I dealing with? I'm dealing with a one that only has one. In that genus of oneness, there's only one. There can't be two. Okay? Then there's another element in that oneness. We don't experience oneness in that way of oneness, of the only oneness. We experience it in the altogetherness of that. So therefore, there is this chant, Echad Yachid Um Yuchad, which is so interesting. We had a, a Sufi uh, teacher here, a Sufi sheikh here, and one of the things we got to deal with was that there is an Arabic chant that goes with the same words, Achad Wachid Was Samad, one unique and yoked together. <laughs> you know, that's the, word, that's the language that they use to say, all together one. We're all together one. So, most of the time, there's this crazy thing, I don't know how to express it. When we think of God being one, we go something like this. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. God is one. And I, the other, know it. <laughs> do, do you see what I'm saying? But, but you, you laughed while you, at the same time that you recognize that most of the time that's how we do it, you know? And we don't go in enough to be able to see ourselves in uh, that way of looking at the world which people call participatory epistemology, you know? What it means is, and what I understand, I realize that I don't understand it as outside of me, but I am participating in what I understand. So when I go and do this oneness, I have to go to the place where I get included, get absorbed in that oneness. And that's what this chant is for, to be able to help us with that, okay? And every time you will see that there's the temptation is to get to two, go to two-ness, there is that thing that you want to go, no, this is one, this is one. This is one com composed of all that, this is still one. So do you see that this is like saying, I want to have a oneness meditation now. And what do I call that? I call it making a yichud. Making a yichud, make a unification, you know. Okay, again. With that kavana, okay?
And now this chant has a cousin. And the cousin of this chant says, what we have done more or less in space, you know, one in space, we haven't done it in time. So how do you do one in time? So it goes like this. Tell me the heart, yeah? It's not your hand that you have. Okay. It should be here. Good. This one counts time. It says always and forever. It goes into always and forever one. Okay?
Now, you have seen that one of the things about mantras that's important, about those repetitive chants that's important, is that we can do it all the time on the inside. And so I'd like to teach a little bit about that, about the inner and outer mantras, but not before you get up and stretch a little bit, okay? Would you please do that? I begin with the question, of the flywheel. What's the good of a flywheel? It manages, you know, do you remember that little thing that we used to give a pull and then we could dance it on a string? Remember that? A, a, gy a gyroscope it was. And we were able to, to make it run on a string. Why was that? Because the flywheel creates a certain kind of resistance to change, okay? If you could imagine that you could finally listen to all the messages that play inside of you on that flywheel, And so I want to spell something out because it has a, a, a very strong significance to bringing about change. If I go and check out how people have been ralphed and gestalted <laughs> and they have done uh, Jungian therapy and they have done all kinds of stuff, but in the end what bugged them still remained. So that the inside therapy, I, how many times I said, oh wow, now I understand it, you know, I've got it clear. So how come it didn't change? How come that I, I go right back to where I was? And Jean Houston once pointed this out to me, that no change can go on without changing the mantra. You cannot stop the mantra, but you can make, record over it a stronger one, okay? So that's where the whole business of affirmations comes to people. Because, why do they make an affirmation? They say, I affirm such and such, I affirm such and such. Now imagine, for instance, A person smokes cigarettes, tobacco, and he's already got the beginnings of emphysema. But he can't give away the cigarette. What has happened inside of him, you know what, what we call addiction? Pay to the attention to the word. Dicere is to speak. Addict means address, something that speaks to, okay? It speaks to, it speaks to almost like saying, this will be nice to you, this will be good to you, but it speaks to you this way, with, with its demands. Okay? <coughs> so if a person has an addiction that goes something like this, I'm a shmigeg, I don't amount to something, my mother said so, my father said so. In school they called me a nerd, you know, and so on and so forth. And that is introjected material. And that goes like a mantra, all the time. That's how I present myself even to myself, with this mantra, who I am. So, can you see how important it is that if we have a deep commitment to a truth, to a healing of the planet, to, to what we are committed to, that we don't at the same time always check out the mantra. Take a look, there's a mantra of convenience that says, take a shortcut, take a shortcut, you know? And there's a mantra of 
integrity that says, don't take the shortcut, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing. And very often it's a question almost like what program is operative at that particular point. And so the question then is, can I install another program? And the insight helps, and the behavior change, behavior modification helps. But one of the things that has to go along with that is the change of the mantra. So, when I ask myself about Hanukkah especially, what is that mantra? So, <laughs> the mantra is written on a dreidel. Now that's that, that top that we spin that has four letters on it, Nes Gadol Hayasham. A great miracle occurred there. Which is most of the time, we have a cynical point of view which says, miracles can't happen. Miracles don't happen. Miracles don't happen. Miracles don't happen. So then come eight days in the year, when we do the mantra, miracles do happen, miracles do happen, miracles do happen, miracles do, do happen. So you see that the, the, the book on miracles, you know, what those lessons were about, basically, to say that it is not as determined as you think it is, it is not as mechanical as you think it is, it is alive, it is organic, it responds, you know, and so you have a whole other way of understanding that. So that's the mantra for Hanukkah to be able to, uh, to, to make happen. The miraculous order does exist and I can log on to the miraculous order. The kind of things that we are now talking about, if I go back to 1930 and would have talked about non-local uh, knowledge, you know, and would have talked about simultaneity, that exists between one end of the universe to the other, not, not at light speed, but simultaneous at this thing. If I would have talked about strings keeping reality together, you know, if I would have talked about, if you look at anything, you get to see that it's like fractals of fractals of fractals all the way up and down, you know. People would have said, you're crazy. Because they were so involved in the industrial, as out of the industrial revolution, to be able to say only the product exists, only the money exists, only that which you can touch exists, and so on and so forth. So they didn't, they didn't own that. Now, take a look, we know this already. I mean, we've read about quantum uh, point zero fields, we have read about all these wonderful things, and we have. Uh, admired uh, Stephen Hawking, and so on. But we haven't installed it in ourselves yet, that this is what the, re what the real universe is like, you know. We still have running the old tape, it is all mechanical, it's all objective, it's all mechanical, it's all objective. And this is what, what needs to change this, this Hanukkah time. Now I'm going to make an excursus in the other direction, because I raised the question, for instance, what is Hanukkah for Christians? You know, where, does that, where does that come in? Certain things come into the universe from time to time, but sometimes it takes them several times to come in and to create the amalgam. There was a necessary amalgam between Judaism and Greek, if you will, mythology, Greek life. And that had to wait, it couldn't come at the time when the Maccabees were, it had to come later on. So what comes out is that the people who were the Maccabees, at least in our prayer book, it says that your Hasidim arose against those um, Syrian idolaters. Your Hasidim uses that word. So when you think of that stream 
that is not satisfied with merely fulfilling the outer shell of religion, but that says there is something deeper in there, and I'm not buying it for the outer shell, I'm buying it because of the deeper thing that takes me to greater places, to greater intimacy with God, that's why I'm interested in that. And so that makes people go to Qumran, to set up the Dead Sea Scroll situation that makes people do uh, those things that they call the, the conscious ascent of their soul, going to higher, to higher regions and so on. And into that situation comes an expectation of redemption. And the question comes, who are the people who talk about that redemption, not so much in terms of the outer redemption, but the inner redemption? And that you could see the Hasidim had done that earlier before. That in the Dead Sea Scrolls they separated themselves in order to have a um, conscious and dedicated community that would be able to live according to the ideals that, that they had. The rest of the, the, the population didn't do it this way. One of the things that happened was that these people, they looked wild. Um, I can imagine them today uh, looking with dreadlocks, you know, wearing some kind of tattered clothing and telling people what you're doing is all wrong, there's only one way out, that's to repent and to enter into the Divine Kingdom because if you're going to let go of that, you're lost completely. The physical kings out there, Herod and Caesar, they're very lousy. There's another kind of king that you can serve. Okay. So, and that is spiritual, and so they go and they give you that that possibility. You separate yourself from the community at large and you live after you have undergone dipping the mikveh. And so there's a man by the name of Yohanan who says, wherever I go and I look around, you're so dirty. You're so dirty. Wash that off. Come, take a dip, you know. And he has a place by the Jordan River where he invites people to come and take a dip so that they might enter into the kingdom, okay? So here comes Jesus, the carpenter's son from the Galilee, and he shows up there. He has been looking for this kind of thing that would open his heart to what he knew deep, deep inside, namely, that I am not just a human being, I'm a child of the living God, and God is my Abba, okay? And he begins to go and say, I want to dip into that, you know? And he dips into that, and he goes around and proclaims that. So I just want you to get a feel of how Hanukkah moves into, in, into that situation. And it would be wonderful for Christians to be able to at their Christmas celebration, make a Seder. What do I mean by that? People go and have a, a fancy dinner, eating more than they need to eat, and then um, after the usual small talk and ribbing each other in the family, they pounce on the presents. Now, if I ask myself, what would a Seder, a Christmas Seder, look like? It would have the table set the same way, you know. It would have three bowls, one bowl that would have um, frankincense, another bowl that would have myrrh, and an empty bowl into which everybody could put their rings and their jewelry, you know. At least for the time of the Seder, like this. It would have uh, something with fours, of course, it has to have four. For the, for the four evangelists. The, the, the. It would have to have uh, uh, some pitas on the table, loaves. 
and for everybody at least one spread, one sardine. <laughs> you know? Sardine. Do you see what, what I'm getting at? It's like celebrating, celebrating the thing, you know? And then you have a situation where, where the bottle of wine has run out, you know? And somebody says, uh, we need some more, you know? And they bring some white wine bottles to the table and they say, here's some water. <laughs> you know? And then they begin to drink it in memory of that situation. Do you, do you, do you get the point? What this amounts to is that there would be the story told, the Haggadah, that's, that's what we have in Pesach, we tell the story. It would begin by a moment of sanctification. This is not going to be just a regular party. We are going to make this holy. And everybody raises their cup of wine or grape juice and, and says a thank you to God for that and begins with that, right? Could you imagine by the time you come to the main meal and you have the main meal served, everybody's happy, and then you grab something like, again, the matzah, the afikoman, and you say, everybody have a piece of this, you know, and eat it with that kind of reverence. This is not a mass, it is not licit, it is not something that that is doing it by according to the church, but it's doing according to our feeling to our imagination, and in this, in this way we do that. So then there would be a thanksgiving. And what do you call thank you in Greek? How do you say thank you in Greek? Evcharisto, from which you get the word Eucharist. Eucharisto, okay? I mean, do you see how these things go together? And when I think of the years in which we didn't communicate across the fence and give each other uh, meaning that would help us go through life better. What, what a pity that is. But once we realize that we live in a post-triumphalist world and that every religion is a vital organ of the planet, if we help the other one to be healthier and, and by being healthy ourselves and giving some insight, what a wonderful thing that is. One more Hanukkah song I want to sing to you um, that comes from a man who worked very hard in the garment district. Uh, if you understand, you heard about sweatshops and the fire that took out in, in, some, in the garment district and the difficulty that people had and the troubles they had to unionize and so on. And they lived in the Lower East Side. <clears throat> and there were some people who didn't want to work on Shabbos, but if you didn't show up in, in the shop, you couldn't make a living and they had children to support. So there was a group that began on Shabbos morning on Rivington Street in Delancey to make their way to the, to the 30th Street and to walk. And so they walked together in groups until they came to 14th Street, to the park there. And there they would do something of Torah reading and they would go on to their jobs so that on the way at least they had made Shabbos. Can you understand what those people went through? What a difficult life they had. And the hours were so long. And this man by the name of Morris Rosenfeld was a poet in Yiddish. And he made uh, up songs, and one song that is really uh, a good Yiddish tearjerker, <clears throat> which begins like this, humble, humble, club, hammer, keep on doing your work. And he describes a whole day's work, but when he comes home and his baby is asleep, and when he leaves in the morning, his baby is still asleep. And very seldom does he see his little boy, and this, this, this is the lament that he has. Okay? So here is this Hanukkah song. I read you, I sing you first one stanza in um, Yiddish, and then the rest of him in a translation that Theodor Bikel made of the uh, original Yiddish song. Okay? 
despair and not yet a hope that ever there would be a, a land of Israel, there would ever be this kind of a return. So we are coming in for a landing. Um, we're going to sing one Freilich tune. Let's do this one in order that one and one be one. This is good with a drum, with, with everything, it's going to be nice. And then I can do something over that a little bit so that it'll come out the way it's meant to come out so people can hear it. In order that one and one be one. In order that one and one be one 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 in order that one and one be one. Once more I'll do with you and then you go on. In order that one and one be one. In order that one and one be one. In 